regular monthly meeting of the Waterloo, Iowa Planning, Zoning, and Programming Commission to order. I apologize for being late. Um, had something that uh, kept me a little longer than I thought it would. So anyhow, first item on the agenda is the approval of the July 10th, 2018 agenda. There any changes? Okay. So we need a motion. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Next item is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting of June 5th, 2018. They were sent out in your packet with the uh, agenda. Are there, is there a motion to approve those minutes or are there any changes or corrections? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Next item is the financial report for May 2018. Mr. Schrader. This is Schrader with staff. Uh, we're at 83% of the year. So go down, down through uh, the expenses. Um, we seem pretty well on track, slightly over, but I think we'll come in pretty close to on budget and revenue. Um, some are already over 100%, which is obviously a good thing, and a few are under, but it's generally looking pretty good. Okay. We have a motion to accept the financial report. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. And opposed, same sign. I guess we don't have anybody opposed. Um, oral presentations. Now we come to the part of the of the uh, meeting when uh, it's, we have time for, sir, if you're gonna talk on the phone, could you please go out the hall? Would, okay, those, those who want to uh, make a presentation either on any item that is not on today's agenda are welcome to come to the uh, microphone right now. Please give us your name, your address, and keep your comments to three minutes, if you would. Hello, um, Carol Gustafson, West Central Neighborhood Association. I live at 209 Forest Avenue in Waterloo. I did not see the overlay um, I thought that it was going to be on today's agenda, but I don't see it on the agenda. So I just want to make sure that I have an opportunity to address you um, on the overlay. Am I missing it? Are ah, you talking it's about on the back. The, yeah, it's on the back. <laughs> okay, well, I'll be back up then. Okay, thanks, Carol. Anyone else? All right, moving on to... Item A, site plan amendment. It's the request by Dahlstrom Properties LLC for a site plan amendment to the M2P planned industrial district for the construction of a 200,000 square foot industrial warehouse building located west of 3050 Wagner Road. We have a staff report. This is starting off with staff. Um, the applicant's requesting to construct a new industrial warehouse. Um, Initially, it was 50,000 square feet with um, expansion to 150,000 square feet. Now they're looking at doing the entire 200,000 square feet initially. Um, they request to construct a warehouse would not appear to have a negative impact on the surrounding area as it's largely industrial. Um, the site is served by Airline Highway and Wagner Road. The area in question is zoned M2P, Plan Industrial District, and it has been zoned as such since the adoption of the zoning ordinance in 1969. Surrounding land uses and their zoning regulate um, to the north is vacant land zone M2P, Plant Industrial District. To the south is the ASPRO Asphalt Manufacturing Plant, zoned M1, Light Industrial District. To the east is um, Gerald Sulky Company, zoned M2, Heavy Industrial District. And to the west is Standard Forwarding and FedEx Ground, zoned M2P. Plant Industrial District. Um, 
there would be necessary to for them to submit a stormwater detention plan to approval of engineering um, the surrounding area was largely industrial all built between 1961 and 2012. the property is located in zone a 100 year floodplain which required a building to be one foot above the base flood elevation as indicated by the federal <clears throat> Insurance Administration's flood insurance rate map, community number 19002501678F, dated July 18, 2011. Um, there is a 12 inch sanitary sewer line located on the north side of Airline Highway. There is 12 inch water lines along Widener Road, Airline Highway, and Midport Boulevard. The future land use map de designates this area as industrial. Um, the proposal site of plan amendment will be in conformance with the comprehensive plan and future land use map for the area the applicant is requesting to construct a um, 200,000 200, square foot building uh, with a 25 spot parking lot the area in question is zoned m2p and plan industrial district this zoning is designated to permit the establishment of industrial parks to provide for the orderly planned growth of industries with large tracks that allow greater flexibility and diversification of land uses and building locations is intended as such industrial parks be developed to maximize potentials of industrial areas, same time minimize the adverse effect upon adjacent properties in the zoning districts. Um, the zoning ordinance requires one parking space for all two people employed at the facility and they're currently showing 25 parking spaces. Um, the site plan does not um, label setbacks and that information will be needed. Um, during tech review, it was noted that the um, engineering would like to see the driveway um, coming out the airline highway moved east to align with the entrance to Aspro on the um, south side of the street, which um, talking to the, the architect for the project, they are willing to do that. Um, and um, traffic department sent an email requesting the driveway to the coming out of Wagner Road be located to the north. Um, and they are currently looking at that situation. Therefore, staff recommends that the request for a site plan amendment to the, in the M2P plan manufacturing district be approved for the following reasons. The request is in conformance with the comprehensive plan and future land use map for the area. The request would not appear to have a negative impact on traffic conditions in the area. The request would not appear to have a negative impact surrounding the areas with the following conditions that the final site plan meets all applicable city codes, regulations, including but not limited to parking, landscape, screening, drainage, setbacks, et cetera, and that the building be one inch, minimum one foot above the base flood elevation. Okay, other questions for staff? Um, this is Butch and I just said one. Um, were you talking about the stormwater detention plan being submitted? What does the abbreviation SWPPP mean? Do you, do you have any idea? It must have something to do with that. Yeah. Storm Water Pollution Prevention Plan. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. This is Gaylord. I have this question about uh, what Gantz noted in the tech, rev uh, the tech review. I, I know that we talked about the driveway going to Aspro or whatever that was that was already in the, uh, already in the packet. But uh, this portion that's in the tech review notes, um, that portion of the packet it said, Gantz notes that there is a fixed on uh, charge and then it goes on to that little mini paragraph. Did that get addressed? Are those concerns hmm. outlined in that section addressed? Yeah, it just means that they will have to pay to be hooked up to the sewer. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Is the applicant here or someone representing the applicant? And if so, would you please come to the podium, give us your name and address and make your presentation? Okay, seeing no one. Um, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak either for or against this item? Please come up and make your presentation. Give us your name and address, sir. Hi, my name is Eric Lee, uh, 3050 Wagner Road. I'm the owner of the Gerald Sulky Company uh, and 2L Assets, which is the corporation that owns the uh, real estate that, at that property. Uh, I would like to express uh, initial support for development. I think development in the uh, industrial park is great. 
Uh, this is out our front door, and uh, I think this would be good for uh, everybody in the area. Uh, I have uh, one concern, uh, and the concern is um, Airline Highway is a very busy and very fast road at this point. Uh, the uh, city engineering, in, in partnership with the Department of Transportation, is in the process of putting up uh, temporary traffic control uh, at the corner of Wagner and Airline Highway because of the speed of Airline Highway, the number of accidents that have happened there, uh, and the fact that traffic is currently detoured from Highway 63 down Airline Highway to 218 at this point. Uh, and I would ask that um, if an additional driveway is going to be placed on each side of that intersection, that that traffic control be made permanent, uh, that permanent uh, stoplights or some form of traffic control uh, be installed at that intersection uh, for the safety of the intersection. And that intersection gets very, very busy at, uh, at both ends of the rush hour period. Uh, and I would also request that um, uh, airline highway in general be reviewed. Um, the intersections, uh, which are already in place, uh, ASPRO, uh, Midport and um, the driveway to FedEx up and down there, they do have significant challenges getting in and out of traffic, particularly around rush hours because Airline Highway does move so fast. Uh, so just a general review of Airline Highway, if we're adding more traffic to it, uh, I'm assuming 200,000 square feet is going to be uh, a good chunk of truck traffic, uh, not just 25 people who are permanently placed there uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and so managing that truck traffic on and off of Airline Highway and Wagner Road, uh, I think would be an important part of this plan. So, that's all I've got. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else in the room that would like to speak either for or against? Okay, seeing no one, if there's any discussion amongst commissioners or we'll entertain a motion. Who could, this is Butchin, so who, who would um, be the one for us to talk to about the light? Is that an issue that we need to worry about here at this point? This is Schrader with staff. Staff will um, bring that concern up with uh, the appropriate staff, which will include the engineering department and the traffic department, the uh, traffic engineer, Muhammad Allahi, um, to discuss that issue of whether or not we can look to move to make permanent lights at that location. Any other discussion? If not, we'll entertain a motion. This is Mihi. I make a motion to uh, approve the site plan amendment in the M2P plan manufacturing district with the condition that uh, one, that the final site plan meets all applicable city codes, regulations, et cetera, including but not limited to parking, landscaping, screening, drainage, setbacks, et cetera. And number two, that the building be a minimum one foot above the base flood elevation. Okay, we have a, a motion. Second. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Request is granted. Site plan, I guess, is approved. Um, next item, request by Stephanie Hartel for a special permit to establish a commercial kennel with an outdoor run area within a C2 commercial district located at 950 Shearer Avenue. And I will say that since the applicant is a good friend of mine, I'm going to abstain from this one. Staff report. This is Dornoff with staff. Um, the applicant is requesting to establish a dog kennel for the purpose of, of dog daycare and boarding facility. The request could have a potential negative impact to surrounding area. The site was formerly a dance studio and it access to Shear Road just off of University Avenue. Um, the building for the proposed kennel is 119 feet from the closest residential property, 121 feet less than the 250 feet required. And the proposed outside run area is proposed to be 182 feet from the closest residential property, 318 feet less than the 500 feet required. The business will be located on Shear Avenue, which is a local street. Shear connects to University Avenue, Frontage Road, and University Avenue, which is a principal arterial. A trail is being constructed along the south side of University Avenue as part of the University Avenue reconstruction project located just to the north of the site. There's currently no sidewalks in the area, although a sidewalk will be installed on the north side of University Avenue as part of the University Avenue reconstruction project. A condition to require a sidewalk along Shear should be considered for a future connection to the trail system to be built along University Avenue. The property in question is zone C2 commercial district and has been zoned as such since the adoption of zoning ordinance in 1969. Surrounding land uses and their zoning as follows. 
to North Commercial Businesses Zone C2 Commercial District and University Avenue, to the South Residences Zone R2 1 and 2 Family Residence District, to the East Commercial and Residential Zone C2 Commercial District, and to the West Vacant Land part of the um, Green Hill University Interchange um, that currently has no zoning and Vacant Land Zone C2 Commercial District. <clears throat> the site includes a commercial building built in 1974. Development in the area includes commercial built between 1973 and 2006 and residential built between 1955 and 1961, along with a duplex built in 1986. Buffering would not be required as part of the request, but could be considered as part of condition to help request mitigate noise concerns. The request would not appear to have negative impact on drainage in the area. The property is not located within a floodplain. There is an eight inch sanitary sewer line located in Flower Street as it turns south between the properties located south of the site. There is also a 15 inch storm sewer located in Shear Avenue that turns into a 21 inch storm sewer in Flower Street that turns south in Scott Street. There is four inch strange tiles on both sides of the street. The future land use map designates this area as commercial. The special permit request would be in conformance with the future land use map for the area. The request is located in primary growth area. The applicant is requesting open a dog, key, dog care center a kennel at 950 Shear. The applicant is proposing to have an ex, outside exercise area to the north of the building. The lot in question is on C2 Commercial District. However, all kennels housing five or more dogs must apply for a special permit. The 6,300 square foot building was previously home to a dance studio. Therefore, staff does not see there will be increase in traffic entering the area and will likely see fewer traffic peaks compared to the dance studio. According to section 10-15-116 of the ordinance, it requires that any principal building be at least 250 feet from a residentially zoned property and that any outside exercise or runaway area be at least 500 feet from a residentially zoned property. The principal structure is only 119 feet from a residentially zoned structure and the proposed exercise area is only 182, 182 feet from the residentially zoned structures. Board of Adjustments would need to issue a variance to these two requirements in addition to approving the special permit itself. Because of the need for variances to allow for the location of the building and outside extra runway area, staff does have concerns about the amount of time that dogs would be outside. Therefore, staff um, is adding a condition that limit the amount of time the dogs would be outside. Additional screening could be required along the south property line to help mitigate any noise. During tech review, there was concerns express about the amount of noise created by the amount of dogs. There is also concern about the amount of waste which was created by the operation, how it would be taken care of. Um, it was also requested a note to check with Iowa Department of Natural Resources, Department of Agriculture and USDA, anything that would be required for kennels. However, <clears throat> contacting them, they only require for um, actual dog breeding operations. So there's nothing in there codes that require anything for kennels. Um, therefore, staff would recommend the approval of the request for a special permit to allow for establishment of dog, key, dog daycare for the following reasons. To so be in informants with the comprehensive plan and future land use map for the area. Um, the request would not appear to have a negative impact on pedestrian or vehicular tra traffic conditions in the area with the following conditions that the final site plan meets all applicable city codes, regulations, et cetera, including but not limited to parking, landscaping, drainage, et cetera. Variants are approved by the Board of Adjustments to allow for a kennel principal building to be within 250 feet of residentially zoned property and the, that an exercise runway area be within 500 feet of residentially zoned property and the outside exercise area only be used for supervised walking exercise of the dogs and not be used for extended periods. Any questions for staff? Okay, thank you, John. Yep. <clears throat> Would the applicant or someone representing the applicant like to come forward and, and uh, make a statement?
Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Hartel. Thank you for your time today. Um, I am the person who is requesting a um, doggy daycare and boarding facility. The one thing that I want to clarify, though, this is not a dog kennel. It is a doggy daycare um, with 24-hour staff. Um, we do not put any dogs in any kennels or crates or cages. Um, it is completely cage-free um, boarding and uh, daycare. So we will also offer obedience and grooming as well. So before I go any further, I would, would like to hear any opposition first before I go any further, if that's OK. Do you want people in the audience to come forward? And if there are any. Then you'll come back? Yes. Is that OK? OK. Yeah, I think so. OK, thank you. Um, I forgot to ask this question, but uh, I was just wondering, has there been any, any significant opposition uh, from the neighbors. This is do not, by the way. Um, st staff has received one letter which you have in front of you, and also there has been two other phone calls about it okay. in opposition. Thank you. We also have two letters of support as well for this doggy okay. daycare. All right. Well, if you want to come up and speak after the uh, members of the audience speak, then that's fine. Um, so that said, anyone in the room I, that uh, wants to speak either for or against this item, please come to the podium, give us your name and address, and uh, make your comments. Keep them to three minutes, if you would, please. My name's Larry Hellerman. I live at 1024 Scott Avenue, four houses down from the kennel that they're proposing, or not a kennel, but a daycare. Obviously, none of the requirements are met for the zoning of it. Someone that made the zoning originally had reasons for the zoning in that way. Everybody that I've talked to close enough in the neighborhood with five, six houses aren't in support of it. Um, most of the concerns are probably all the noise from it. I don't know if you've ever gone by any other dog kennels where the dogs are boarded in there. They're noisy, they're barking all the time. Even if they're in the building, you can hear them outside. And it's a quiet neighborhood. I kind of enjoy sitting outside in the patio and I don't need to listen to dogs. There's a lot of dogs in the neighborhood and they're kept quiet. But with dogs barking at the end of the street, it'll probably make all the neighborhood dogs bark. It'll be just a dog barking chain down the road. And I'm really against it. I don't think it meets any of the requirements for the neighborhood. I don't think we need it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Melanie Nelson. I live at 1011 Scott Avenue, which is two houses away from the proposed facility. Uh, my primary concern also would be the noise and the distance from the houses. Um, I can see that right from my backyard. I just don't think that, you know, you'll be able to keep the noise levels down. I don't know that any of you would like that in your backyard. Um, I'm concerned about the noise. If you're at Viridian Credit Union in the drive up lane, Positive Pet Care has a boarding facility and it's indoors. You can hear the dogs barking constantly from there. And that's probably further away from this, would be from our homes. Um, I'm concerned about our property values declining. If people were looking for houses in our neighborhood and saw a dog boarding kennel there, I wouldn't buy one there. Um, so primarily the property value, the constant noise, um, I'm not sure what they plan to do with the smell, the feces. Um, what if dogs get loose, um, dogs biting? But yeah, it would set off the dogs in our neighborhood that are kept quiet. And then who do we complain to if the city approves this um, with the dogs barking over there, possibly 24 hours a day? Because our dogs are supposed to be kept quiet and people would call animal control if our dog is barking. So. Who do you call if, if these dogs are barking? So I'm opposed to it as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
By the way, I told you wrong at first. You keep your comments to five minutes, not three. So I apologize. Come ahead. Uh, I'm Jim Venny from 1031 Scott. Uh, I'm probably within four or five houses away from it. And uh, something like this needs to be in more of a non-residential area. And I know because I've boarded my own dog before. And I know how noisy they can be. And I, I too am concerned about the property values. And um, if they go down, are you gonna lower my taxes? I highly doubt it. And uh, all I ask is that uh, you consider this like um, you're considering it going into your own neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? So hello, uh, Mitch Zimmerman. I uh, live at 1001 Scott Avenue. So I would be the closest house to the facility, the one that uh, is violating all of the, uh, the uh, requirements in place. Um, so I would say um, I've been a homeowner and a resident in Waterloo for five years. Um, a major reason that I purchased my home was to come home after work and uh, have a place to relax, whether it be relaxing on my patio, um, getting a good night's sleep, um, the biggest advantage of a, of a house is space, right? And so I think that space is defined as both physical space and audible space. Um, so nobody door ding in my car in an apartment parking lot. Nobody slamming doors at 2 a.m. Nobody's dogs barking throughout the night. Um, the previous business that was there um, was a gymnastics facility, which I think you um, could have called a nuisance given the amount of cars that were lining the streets. Um, but that facility had a closing time. This facility does not. Um, this facility will have the potential to create noise 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I understand that this property is zoned as commercial. However, I don't think that every business is fit for a commercially zoned property. Um, given the proxim proximity of the residential area and the violations that it is, um, that it is creating, I, I think this is such a case that this is not a suitable business for this commercially zoned property. I think it would be entirely unfair to the people of this neighborhood to allow business with the noise implications that this business brings with it. I'm an avid dog lover. I have two dogs myself, and I appreciate the services they provide. I actually think it's, it's a really cool idea, uh, but I can't say that I would support this in a residential area. Um, not only would our standard of living be lowered, but the values of our house, as the other residents have mentioned, will also be diminished. Um, selling a house next to a boarding facility is not going to be easy. Um, I urge the city to stand with our neighborhood and deny this business the right to use this, this space. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm uh, Tony Try. My son Tyler Try just recently purchased a house in the neighborhood. Uh, we looked around quite a bit and looked for a nice quiet house and found this one on Scott Avenue. I don't know, you don't have any photos up or anything, but behind Scott Avenue between the homes and the medical building that's there, the deer come up through there in the morning and at night. They stay in the woods up around the building. So I see potential problems with wildlife in the area as far as you know, dogs barking at deer and, and what's gonna happen with all that. Um, property value is definitely going to go down. I mean, that's, there's no doubt about that. Um, the dog's barking. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a bad idea and a bad, bad place to, to try to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Dora Schmidt, 1002 Scott. I live right across the street from Mitchell at 1001 Scott. And I'm more concerned about our property values than anything. And also the noise of the barking dogs. Thank you. Okay, anyone else?
My name is Jack Appleby, and I live at 1025 Scott, and I've been out there long and most of you people have been alive. But I want, we don't need the smell out there. You know, I love dogs, but we don't have, we got a dog track out there, why in the hell don't we use that? What do you want to build one, another one up here for so you can close that one up like you did the dog track out on 63 and 57? Did you ever take that in consideration? And if our uh, property prices go down, you guys going to reimburse us what we're going to lose? No, you're not going to do that. So I don't think we need it out there. I love, like I said, I love animals and dogs. My, my youngest son, when we first moved out there, there was a dog track up where the uh, daycare center is. He used to go visit them dogs every day before he'd go to school. He'd be late going to school. But there was no smell in it, and we don't need that out there now. Thank you much. You're welcome. Any other comments? Okay, seeing no one come forward. Just, can we just say that we do have a letter from another um, person in the area? That... Yeah, he already said that. Oh, I didn't know he, he said that. I'm sorry. Um, the applicant want to come forward and speak to everything? Thank you. And I figured most of those issues would be on, on noise. And so I do want to address those. Um, the one thing, again, I want to clarify is this is not a dog kennel. We are not keeping dogs um, in cages or kennels. Dogs in kennels, they do bark. I will agree, they do. Um, dogs who are bored, they bark. Um, but these dogs, this is a different concept of a daycare. Um, it is a franchise based out of San Diego. And um, we are required to have one staff per 16 dogs. And the main um, responsibility for the staff that are in the yards is to interact with the dogs, to engage the dogs. Um, and engage dogs, dogs who have been interacted with, do not bark. I'm not going to say there's not going to be any barking. There may be some, but the goal is to keep the barking at a minimum. Um, <clears throat> Dogs are never left alone. They're never um, unsupervised as well. So 24-7, um, there's so, always somebody with a dog. We do have closing hours. We close at 6.30 PM with daycare. And so what's, what the dogs that are left are in boarding. After 6.30 PM, all the dogs will be inside. We will not have dogs outside after 6.30 PM during boarding. Um, <clears throat> if dogs are in, the, in daycare all day, they're playing all day, they're interacting all day, they get tired. So by the time 6.30 arrives, we feed them, and they basically go to sleep. With and a human, a staff person, stays with the dogs in the same room. So there is no barking overnight either um, inside the building. Um, this isn't a dog track either. I just want to point that out as well. Dogs will not see any deer or any other wildlife in the area. Um, we will have eight foot privacy fences in the outdoor play yard. So dogs will not be able to see out. People will not be able to see in. Deer will not be able to see in. Other dogs, other wildlife will not be able to see in. So this is a high end doggy daycare. Our primary responsibility is to keep the dogs safe. So they will not escape. We will have several um, gates within the building and outside the building that they will have to get through in order to get out the front door. Um, so it is a, a gated system within the building as well. So it's not a daycare and then the front door. So they won't get out um, where they're running around. That is the pr primary um, responsibility that we keep those dogs safe. Um, I wrote some notes here. Um, a couple other things is um, we live in Iowa, and so majority of the year the dogs will be inside. So during the winter, most of the time the dogs will be um, inside unless they have to go outside to uh, go to the bathroom. Um, but again, safety is a concern, so we will not have dogs outside in any freezing temperatures um, when there's a lot of snowfall. And then like today, when it's very hot and humid, the dogs will be inside as well. So this is not a daycare that they're going to be out 
all day long, especially depending on the weather. And Iowa has very strange weather, very extreme weather. And so many times the dogs will be inside, but just go out for a certain amount of time during the day, maybe in the morning when it's um, cooler um, or in, in the later afternoon. But generally, they will not be out all day long either because of the weather here in Iowa. Um, we will. Um, uh, the outside play yards will be a high um, quality synthetic turf that we will clean regularly. It will have drainage holes for urine to escape that will go into a, um, well, whatever the city of Waterloo actually requires, but a drainage pad or the sewer drain or whatever um, is required by the city is that we'll do that. And um, the turf is spot cleaned every day, so there's not going to be a smell coming from the turf. And then at the end of every day, we um, hose the turf down with water and dog-friendly sanitizers and, and cleansers so um, that are odor controlling. The, um, any feces is picked up immediately by staff. That is one of the staff's responsibility. As soon as the, the dog goes to the bathroom, they pick it up. We put it in a plastic bag, seal it, and into a, a sealed container as well. Um, and that will help with odor as well as fly control. So anything um, that will go that will all go into um, garbage um, dispenser that the city will then pick up. So there will be um, very limited um, or any um, possibility of any kind of odor as well. So any other questions? I would, re would like to request, since there is um, less staff here um, by the Planning and Zoning Committee, that we table this until you have more staff that could hear if that's a possibility and to vote. Mr. Schrader with staff. You know, I think we've got, are there two abstentions here? So we've got of uh, five, we need three yes votes to pass. If I understand correctly, Mr. Holdeman and Mr. Mehe are abstentions to anybody else with standing? This is Schrader with staff. It certainly would be the potential to table, but there are only two missing members right now. We're short two members. So. I guess you don't necessarily know that you'll get a lot better odds at the next meeting. Sure. And the Planning Commission is a recommendation only to the Board of Adjustment. So it's up to you, I guess, or and obviously the Commission. Uh, I'm Fred Meehy, and uh, our firm is representing uh, Mrs. Hartall. And I just wanted to make a couple of points, if I could, here. And I. You know, I love the fact everybody's a dog lover here, uh, and yet, but not in my backyard, okay? Stephanie's taken great care. This is such a natural spot for this. We've worked with a lot of veterinary uh, firms and other uh, dog <coughs> uh, kennel type firms. This is completely different than, than any of those. And uh, the building shields all the property owners from, uh, from any outside area. And the other remaining shield is all uh, uh, dense trees, so it's a it's a perfect perfect per, uh, protected spot for dogs and to also uh, uh, create an environment that will protect the neighbors. Uh, we've reached out to two adjoining neighbors, uh, uh, Lark uh, across or, or Beck across the street and Lockard uh, behind that are adjoining, and they both support this proposition. I'd also mention. Okay. Uh, 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 Let him talk, please. Um, Lockard's plan uh, is to redevelop that, and and if they're going to redevelop their ground, they're going to make sure that they've got compatible uses nearby. So the fact that they don't live there uh, might be mis uh, misunderstood that they don't they aren't interested. They're probably as interested or more interested than most would be since they're developers. But I'd also recommend I give your uh, give you a chance to think about these uh, dog parks. Uh, and they're real popular. There's the Pat Bowlesby Dog Park that is on Ainsboro Avenue across from Dr. Nealon, uh, Dr. Nealon's office and, and uh, the Viridian Credit Union. 
Well, that's sm smack dab in uh, with all those homes there, Hollywood. People love those dog parks and, and they add to the value, I think, to that neighborhood. Uh, they adjoin residential neighbors. Uh, if you think in Cedar Falls on Main Street at uh, Highway uh, and University, their dog park, it, it's adjoining all those residences around there. And, and, and I understand the concern of the, of, of the neighbors here, and, and I get that. I don't mean to diminish their, their opinions or, uh, you know, are, are their opinions, but um, Ms. Hartle is passionate about what she's doing, and I've, I've never heard of a program quite like this that is, that, uh, uh, is so in, intensively careful about the, about the pets. The pets are their clients, and, uh, and they care for their clients uh, in a way that uh, uh, probably a lot of uh, daycares uh, could probably emulate. But I, I'll close in saying that uh, uh, we'd, we'd uh, appreciate your uh, thoughtful consideration this afternoon. Yep. I just have one more uh, one more thing else to say is that the reason that we chose this location is because we do want to be centrally located within the Cedar Valley and this is a great location that's centrally located. I do prefer the city of Waterloo. That is my first choice. I mean, I could go to uh, Cedar Falls as well. The, the city of Waterloo is my first choice. This is centrally located and it's um, you know, one of the requirements of this daycare, this doggy daycare, is that it is has easy access for commuter highways or commuter roads, such as Green Hill and University Avenue. Um, and so we want to make it accessible for those people who do use the, the doggy daycare on a regular basis when on their way to work and they want to drop their dogs off. Um, Another reason we picked this location, or really we really like this location, is because it's right off of Green Hill um, Road, which if you take that all the way to 218, you can get to the airport. So it's something that we definitely want to um, support the city of Waterloo, the Waterloo Airport, um, with our boarding facility. And so it's not only here in Waterloo, but also in surrounding towns for, for boarding, that we can you know market our boarders to um, surrounding towns so they can come and fly out of Waterloo instead of going elsewhere as well. So those are some of the reasons why we really like this location. So thank you. Okay. Commissioners. Well, this is Butchen. Um, one of the concerns of the neighbors is noise. And I have two daughters that used to go to that gymnastics studio. I believe that's a metal building. Am I correct? <laughs> Okay, so in your um, handout that you gave us, you said that the growth goals include a maximum of 100 to 120 dogs per day in daycare and a maximum of 40 to 50 per night. I find it hard to believe that you're going to be able to keep that many dogs quiet even during the day. I understand what you're saying, but my dog's usually up till 10 or 10.30 at night, so... And she's pretty active, so I, I'm kind of surprised about that. But I'm just wondering how you're going to address that. This franchise has been around for 10 years, um, and they have seven locations in San Diego, as well as Houston and Atlanta, Georgia, and they're and they're still growing into um, Colorado and North Carolina. Um, so they have a lot of experience with this, and many of the daycares that they have in San Diego do have that many that many dogs. Um, and my husband and I have um, gone out to San Diego, and we have visited those um, daycares, and. Um, the reason is because they keep the dogs active. They keep them engaged, they keep them interactive. All of the daycares, I talked about the synthetic turf, but all of the daycares are also required to have um, play-like yards. So they're required to have ramps and beds and a uh, splash pond and a uh, waterfall and things like that that stimulate the dog. So all of those things, when the dogs are stimulated, they don't necessarily bark. When dogs are bored, they bark. When they hear those noises, they bark. Um, but when they're engaged in what they're doing in that area, um, they don't bark. We purposely make um, each dog area um, a certain size. And so that gives them enough room to move around and be stimulated throughout the day, but not enough room where they are getting too wild and then start barking and things like that. So there is a method um, to this daycare. And... Um, you know, we've been to those daycares, and it is very surprising that there's that many dogs in that area, and it's relatively um, quiet because there is really no barking because they're they're busy. 
Okay, then I have another question then. Those areas that you visited, the other daycares or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever they're called, um, are they real close to housing? Because I drove yes. over there today, and I hadn't been there in a while, yes. and they are really, the, really close. The, the original um, location in Mission Hill, San Diego, is right next to a um, apartment complex. And in 10 years, they've never had any issues. And they're, I mean, it's right, it's closer than um, we are to the houses here. And there hasn't been any concerns or issues there. And I don't think it matters if people own the property um, to have a complaint or not. And there hasn't been, they haven't had any complaints because of noise in that area. This, this is Wilbur. I have a question for staff, but maybe in connection with this. In terms of the condition on the extended, not being outside for extended periods, um, is there like a, an amount of time that you're thinking that that would be? Or what's kind of the, the thought behind that? condition. You know what? Um, we actually were trying to figure that out and we were going to actually, you know, see what the opinion was here and because <laughs> it's one of those difficult things is like how much is reasonable and so. Ms. Hartel, uh, so how, how long generally are animals, I mean, you, you said, so if it well, closes daycare, at 6.30, The daycare they would... is from 6.30 a.m. and 6.30, from 6.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. So depending on the weather and the time of year, I, I can't tell you exactly there's going to be outside from this time to this time or this time to this time. I mean, depending on the time of year, it, it may be different. Um, if it's nicer and cooler in the spring, it might be longer. In the summer right now, when it's hot and humid, it might be very, very short where they just go out to go to the bathroom and, and they come back. So I can't tell you exactly what that will be. So I, I do want to make another comment. You know, a lot of people... Um, spoke about property value, and I don't know whether this is going to affect any kind of property value, but I can tell you that we will make, this is an older building, um, and there needs to be a lot of improvements, and so we plan on making a lot of improvements to this building that I would hope that it would actually either maintain the property value or, or uh, even improve it. Um, this is Do Not, and I have a question. I think it's for staff because it's for clarification. When you have the Cedar Valley Humane Society or the Cedar Bend, um, uh, the adoption shelter is what I'm talking about. What are the, what are their requirements there in part as far as care for animals who are being adopted <laughs> out and um, setback requirements for a facility like that versus what? The question was, and um, I'm Eric Dunant, the question was, what was the requirements for the Cedar Valley, uh, Cedar Bend Humane Society, the Adoption Center, for a place like that versus what would be the requirements uh, for your proposal? Um, and in terms of like setbacks um, <coughs> for neighborhood, for neighborhood housing and everything else uh, along those lines. This is Schrader with staff. So a large portion of the Cedar Bend Humane Society um, predated the zoning requirements um, and they have done expansions over the years that they have uh, gone through the special permit approval process as a kennel facility. So their expansion areas have gone through the exact same approval process and have the exact same standards as this. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other discussion? No. This is me. Um, as uh, noted before, I will be abstaining, but uh, I will bring up a couple points from our vantage point as uh, commission members. You know, as Eric said, or as Eric said, and Eric's commented on, there's been we do see this in a lot of uh, applications related to 
veterinary cl veterinary clinics, uh, the Cedar Bend Humane Society. Uh, we had a couple of doggy daycares, one in downtown Waterloo. So it's not uncommon for this to come in front of us, and we we have uh, historically um, granted granted I believe all of those. So, but my uh, my vote is I have to abstain from the vote today as a representative of the applicant. I this is Butchin. I guess my if I lived in that area and I was, like I said, I was just over there driving around today, I think I would be concerned um, about both the noise and the property values in this area. I would, I would love to see this type of facility because I can see a need in this area. I really can. Um, but I would like to see it, I would like to see it um, somewhere not quite so close to so much residential. I guess that's probably my biggest concern. Okay, any other discussion? If not, we'll entertain a motion. I'm sorry, um, we didn't allow it for them. They requested to have all you folks speak first. And then they came back. But our rule, the, the rules, just a minute. The rules, I'll read it to you. And I believe it is on the agendas that are over there. Maybe it may not be, but interested citizens may speak one time per item. I think so. I think so. Okay, sir. Please, we have a meeting to conduct here, so. Anybody else have any comments? If not, please uh, make a motion. This is Wilbur. Um, I make a motion to recommend approval of the request for a special permit to allow for the establishment of a dog daycare for the um, with the following conditions that the final site plan meets all applicable city codes, regulations, et cetera, including but not limited to parking, <coughs> landscaping, drainage, et cetera. Two, variances are approved by the Board of Adjustment to allow for kennel principal building to be within 250 feet of a residentially zoned property, and then an exercise runway area be within 500 feet of a residentially zoned property. Three, that the outside exercise area only be used for supervised walking exercise of dogs and not used for extended period of time. We have a motion, do we have a second? We have a motion, do we have a second? We have a motion, do we have a second? Someone can second it just to get it on the table regardless of how you're gonna vote, including. Okay, I guess that motion dies for lack of a second. We have a, any further discussion or any other motions? I would just reiterate what um, Eric mentioned earlier in the meeting that our role here as commissioners is just to make a recommendation to the Board of Adjustment and the Board of Adjustment still has to go through their variance process. So this isn't the final step by any means. No, it has to go through Board of Adjustment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pardon me, and then on to City Council. No, just Board of Adjustment. Just Board of Adjustment, okay, sorry. Oh, this is Butchin. I just say if I second that this is if I second this motion, it's motioning to temporarily approve this based on the Board of Adjustment, and I can't do that in all righteousness. It's not your vote. It's your no, second a second would just get it on the floor for a vote. Discussion, yeah. Okay, fine. Then I will second that. Okay, you want want to restate your motion just so we're. 
My motion is to recommend approval of the request for a special permit to allow for the establishment of a dog daycare for the following reasons. One, that, or and with the, excuse me, and with the following conditions. One, that the final site plan meets all applicable city codes, regulations, et cetera, including but not limited to parking, landscaping, drainage, et cetera. Two, variances are approved by the Board of Adjustment to allow for Kennel Principal Building to be within 250 feet of a residentially zoned property and then an exercise runway area be within 500 feet of a residentially zoned property. Three, that the outside exercise area only be used for supervised walking, exercise of dogs, and not be used for extended periods. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. Uh, all right, we'll do a roll call vote. Go ahead. Wilbur. Aye. Mehe, abstain. Abstain. Do not. No. Hutchin. No. Holdeman. Abstain. Okay, motion fails. One yes, two no's, two abstains. It is just a recommendation. It'll go on to the Board of Adjustment the uh, fourth Tuesday. Okay, thank you all for coming. Next item on the agenda is plat. It's a request by Michael Dahl and Brian Kennett for a preliminary plat of Ken Dahl, first edition, a five lot residential subdivision located at 4245 West 4th Street. Do we have a staff report? Uh, this is Andrew, staff. Um, I don't know if you are interested, if you want to hear them both together uh, as, as one request. Um, well, actually, do we need a motion to put both of these together, the preliminary and final? We can give one staff report regardless, and then it can yeah. be up to the commission whether they make one motion or two motions. All right, sounds good. Okay. Go ahead. Well, this was... Oops. Sorry about that. This was before the commission last month, uh, so I'll just kind of briefly go over things. Um, it was a previously a four lot preliminary plat. They've now come back with a five lot preliminary plat. Um, the property was rezoned on June 4th of uh, this year to R1 from A1 Agricultural District. Um, uh, at the last uh, meeting, uh, we noted some concerns as far as items that still needed to be addressed. Um, so we did receive a deed of dedication, which I did hand out to you uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so I'll just kind of go over. Uh, for the preliminary plat, um, we still do not have existing and proposed contours being delineated so we can know the difference between such. Um, so that does need to be shown on the uh, preliminary plat. Um, in the sidewalk is shown on the preliminary plat, but it is not addressed in the deed of dedication. Also, uh, maintenance of that detention pond is not addressed in the deed of dedication. Uh, there are two tracts of land in the plat. Tract A, which was uh, on 4th Street, which is a roadway that was required by easement. Uh, therefore, uh, Tract A needs to be in the deed of dedication with some wording saying that will be dedicated to the city of Waterloo is right away. Um, and then Track B, uh, which is next to Lot 11, I believe, of Audubon Park, 5th edition, just to the east, uh, it's the intention of the developer to sell that track to that abutting property owner, so that should uh, be addressed in uh, deed of dedication as well. Um, and also, they're showing an ingress, egress easement back to Lot 5. Um, there should be wording in the deed of dedication that addresses that uh, easement as well. So uh, they do mention other easements, you know, perpetual easements for utilities and um, uh, such as gas, water, sewer, electric, et cetera. So um, those are some of the changes we'd like to see needed or done to the deed of dedication. Um, we are still recommending approval of both the preliminary and final plats uh, with the condition that um, they are uh, the changes are addressed as required by staff before it is forwarded to the city council. Um, but as far as lot five goes, um, 
that was a tract at the, uh, during the last plat. Um, uh, they are, it's our understanding, they are proposing to sell that to the property owner just to the east of that lot, and that's the lot with the large white barn on it. So uh, the intention is to demolish the other two accessory structures and keep the barn on that property. So um, if that barn does re remain and is sold to that owner to the east, uh, does exceed the accessory structure square footage limits, so they would need to obtain a variance to have uh, over that 1,800 square foot amount. So um, that's just kind of a brief overview. I didn't want to go back into it all again so since we are kind of familiar with the plot. So are there any questions for staff? Um, this is do not. Um, have Dennis Gantz's questions by, uh, with the engineering department, has his questions been answered to um, to his satisfaction about removal of the accessory um, structures and and the contour questions he had well the contour questions are the proposed and existing contours that are supposed to be on the preliminary plat they are shown but we can't tell the difference between what's existing and what's proposed um, I did speak with the applicant before the meeting they did obtain a demolition permit today to demolish those other two structures. And um, have your, I mean, I just have a notation that you pointed out some concerns about the um, deed of dedication. Have your questions been answered through what we got today? Uh, that's, I mean, just received it yesterday. So that's just based on my review within the last day or two. Uh, so those are the questions that do need to be addressed uh, and added in. And most specifically sidewalk, um, we, we'd we like to have a sidewalk in the subdivision. Um, it doesn't have to be constructed right away just as the lots develop uh, because there is sidewalk on the west side of 4th Street and there is a pedestrian crossing over Highway 20, so. And is staff comfortable with things being passed with what what is missing? Or I mean, is the the amount of things that are missing, is that a, is that um, to a level of items that would be satisfactory for staff so that it could be approved? We, yes, we will not forward this until the conditions are met that we require of the plats. Okay, thank you. This is me. Um, can, can you explain what the, I'll call it the panhandle is as far as lot five, maybe behind lots three and four. Uh, let me get to the preliminary plat here. What was your question again, Matt? I'm just trying to understand the lot five looks like a like Oklahoma panhandle. Mm -hmm. No, it's actually, it is rectangular. It, what you, I think you're seeing coming in there is the 20 foot access easement that goes out to 4th Street. Is that what you're seeing? No, uh, it'd be directly to the south behind. Uh, oh, okay. That's actually track B, which is supposed to go to that lot owner to the east in Ottoman Park, 5th edition. Understood. Thank you. Yep. Okay, any other questions for staff? If not, thank you. Is the applicant here or someone representing the applicant that would like to make make some statements? Go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> Tell us who you are and what your address yep. is. Okay. So my name is uh, Mike Dahl. I'm uh, actually a resident currently in uh, Cedar Rapids at 3538 Timber Ridge Trail. However, my partner, my equal partner in this uh, property is Brian Kennett, who actually is a resident there at 4245 West 4th Street. There's a farmhouse there, and uh, he, he lives there. He's a plumber. He's on a huge project. He really desperately wanted to be here. He's very young, very engaged, but he just couldn't be here. So I said, hey, I'll... I'll uh, Unless they ask me deep plumbing questions, I'll, I'll be, be able to represent us. So having said that, I would point out that Tim's been very gracious. So we had the final plat and all of that in a long time ago ahead of all the deadlines. And then <clears throat> some of my ignorance, I didn't have the deed of dedication in 
but then I did submit that. But I guess perhaps in Cedar Rapids, it's a little different. It didn't have all the restrictive covenants and the easements, you know. And so I did have uh, my attorney revise that and just got it to him. So I, I apologize for, for that. <clears throat> Having said that, I think, and I don't want to overstep my bounds, but I think, you know, the planning and zoning and, and we're all sort of on the same page. Uh, with regard to everything we've asked for, there's one exception that I guess I want to talk about, and that's the sidewalk. And uh, <clears throat> so it's not in the deed of dedication, but uh, my partner and I are quite resistant to the idea of putting a sidewalk that leads to nowhere. And uh, we appreciate the city wanting sidewalk, but the Audubon uh, first edition right to the south of us has no sidewalk. So in other words, if you were on our property, one of the four lots or even the fifth lot in the back, and you walk to the south along the east side of 4th Street going south, you would end up in, a, you know, in grass. There is no sidewalk there. Then if you decided to go north, you would then come to the Audubon 6th edition, and again, it's grass. There is no sidewalk. And if you continued walking north, you'd eventually come to Highway 20. And there is no overpass for Highway 20. I don't know that the city would put another overpass there on the east side of the bridge. There is one on the west. But I presume it'd be relatively unsafe to walk north and walk on the grass and then cross the street right in front of a bridge, you know. So we're resistant to the idea of having to put a sidewalk in now, but we certainly appreciate making a commitment on behalf of any future lot owner to put a sidewalk in at such time that there is somewhere that it goes to. Uh, there also is a residence right now, which you could call lot one, which is an original farmhouse. And we're doing some remodeling and permitting and everything along those lines. But to the extent we'd have to do a sidewalk for every lot, then our take is that we would have to put a sidewalk in right away on the house that exists on that first lot. And again, it leads to nowhere. There is a full sidewalk on the west side that does have an overpass going north and connects to a sidewalk going south. So we would just graciously ask, and I don't know the formality or how this, maybe this gets put in the deed of declaration, but we would be fine having us or whoever the future owners are of the said lot put in a sidewalk at such time that there's some connection to it. And uh, we appreciate the fact that a new lot owner is sort of stuck with this condition if we just let it go with you have to have a sidewalk. But, you know, people are smart and they realize that's a fairly significant expense when, again, it doesn't really go anywhere. And I can't see that it's going to. But <clears throat> anyway, not to beat a dead horse, but that I think is the only contention we have uh, is the requirement of a sidewalk at this time that again, would really go nowhere. Any questions <clears throat> for the applicant? I, I would like to, I would just like to point out, it would be pretty obvious, but I would be a person who would need to use a sidewalk. So I think that would be obvious um, with me using a wheelchair. So I, I really do believe in having sidewalks where it's applicable and, and um, uh, complete streets policy. I, I believe in that idea. So. Yeah, that's my only comment there about the sidewalks. Yeah, well, I, I believe in sidewalks as well. It's just it doesn't lead anywhere. Yeah. It would really be a sidewalk running in front of the lot of whoever builds their house first. I'm with you. I'm not anti-sidewalk. I just, it's not going to go anywhere. And I think everyone is going to have to cross the street if they want to cross 20 or go to the south and use a sidewalk. So again, I'm just asking for a provision that when there is a connection there, then then whoever the landowner is at that time needs to put in the sidewalk. I'm not suggesting we never put one in. I just, it could be years before there's a sidewalk that would actually go anywhere beyond the the five lots that we've asked for. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Any <clears throat> Pardon me. Any other <clears throat> questions or comments? Or I, I have one more about... Uh, about the building. So yes, I did get a permit today and that was discussed. We always intended to take down two of the structures. One is an old uh, 
um, we'll call it a hog facility. It's a long, narrow structure. And as I understand the city ordinance, there's a 1,800 square foot maximum for outbuildings, and that building alone uh, exceeds that. We've, we've offered to tear that down all along, so that's never been a problem. And then there's a building right in the middle with a cul-de-sac, so to speak, around it. That's a lean-to, kind of an old machine shed. That's coming down as well. The building we've referred to as a barn, there's actually... It's actually somewhat historic. It's in a magazine article. I thought to bring it, but I don't think it's an issue uh, that it remains. But it was a corn crib that was sort of modified into this barn. It's really cool. It sounds a little cheesy, but if you saw it, it's really a neat property. And the people to our straight to our east love it so much that they have uh, approached us about buying that lot. So that piece of property that's lot five started out to be a tract. <clears throat> But then it was a fairly large you know, piece of land that would just basically then be a tract of land that would have to be attached. So in one of our P&Z meetings, it was discussed about making that a full-blown lot. So to accomplish that, we have the uh, easement coming to 4th Street for permanent access to that lot five. But the other thing I want to point out is that barn, corn crib, whatever, would not exceed then the city's 1,800 square feet. So I, I don't think, I, the, you made a comment there, Tim, and I don't think if that's a true lot that that's a factor anymore because it's not going to be added up with the outbuildings on the property to the east to the extent they buy it. Is that correct? Uh, no, that, no, that they purchase it and tie the lots together. We include the other detached structure well we wouldn't we i'm not proposing they tie them together i'm they have to they, unless they build a house oh yeah you can't okay. have an accessory building on a lot by itself okay yeah. so but, if they buy it they have to build a house on it or, so, get, or, or attach get the variance. it or get variance. oh okay well that wasn't clear maybe to us but I mean, okay simply what they can do is just connect it through a restrictive covenant if you know, a variance has to, has to be approved first. So how do I deal with that in the deed of declaration? They're interested, but it's not a done deal. You know how these things can go. Uh, deal's not good to the monies on the wood, so to speak. So it's not, as of right now, sold to them. This final, this is Schrader with staff, this final plat cannot be approved by the city council until there is some sort of variance approved by the Board of Adjustment because either number one, this lot with that garage is going to go to the neighbor to the east okay. and, and that needs a variance or number two, it's not going to go to them and maybe somebody's going to build a house on it. But when in the meantime, it's an accessory building on a lot without a house and it would need a variance that route. Oh, so either way then. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, my ignorance is showing, but when does that take place, that process? Should I be asking for that variance now, I would, assume? Would it, would there be less than 1,800? Well, I don't know if you'd have the size to go to Yeah, that, do you remember what that building is, Tim? It's like 1,100, I think. I don't know. That sounds right, but I, I can't. It's around that. It's, it's not. We'll have to review if they could do a restrictive covenant to the existing house even if it's a temporary restrictive covenant. We could look at that, that might possibly avoid the variance. Okay, yeah, we, we yeah we wanna, it's a neat building, everyone in the neighborhood likes it. In fact, like I say, the one neighbor wants to buy it just because of that building, but <laughs> anyway, okay. I have a question for staff then too, <clears throat> about the historical preservation uh, quality of the barn or the corn crib. Is it actually something that is, would fit historical preservation guidelines, or is it just his opinion? This is Schrader with staff. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm not sure. I'll defer to <laughs> That's a good question. Thorn off with staff. <laughs> Thorn off with staff. Um, it is not consider. I mean, it has never been reviewed by a certified um, historian, so it's nothing official about it. It would have to be certified, um, be surveyed by it. Um, somebody to meet the Department of Interior Standards to say, yes, it is historical, then it would have to go through a review process and um, be submitted. So, yeah, at all this that time, said, it's it could very well be historic and it's certainly worth saving. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, good question. Is there 
is there a period of time that it has to meet like 50 years it can be considered historical or 50 or? years is the limit yeah okay i have a question for the applicant you sure. may have addressed this and i missed it no that's so fine I apologize um if you don't sell that lot five to the people behind it right what are you going to do with it sell it as a lot so that's what that's why it started out as a tract and then in one of the pnz meetings it's like well this could be a lot and we're like well yeah i guess it probably really okay. should be a lot so great question and yeah if it's not a lot and it's just a tract and the people to the east don't buy it well then it could just sit there right i mean somebody 10 miles down the road probably wouldn't sort of buy this piece of land that's entrapped in the middle of, you know, but it does have this easement with it, which, so that's, that seemed really important to give access to that piece of land back there. Um, but there's a reasonable probability that people to the east will buy it, but uh, it's not, you know, I've kind of been trying to get the platting all approved to make sure they know what they're buying. So uh, it's kind of a, been a double-edged sword. This is Schrader with staff. So there's nothing in the subdivision ordinance that specifically prohibits the establishment of a buildable lot like this that's kind of essentially back behind the other lots with an access easement only. Um, although even though there's nothing in the subdivision ordinance that prohibits it, it is a little bit unusual. It's not typical of modern development and a little bit concerning although it's a little bit of a unique situation so maybe it's not that big of a deal I, I would just point out one more thing there's an existing driveway going just almost exactly where that easement is now you know give or take a few feet and then we sort of need that easement on the property lines anyway between lot one and two and then that gives us sewer and water access to the back of the property. So um, although it may not be typical, like I said, it really, there is a driveway there now and it's probably, I presume, been there, you know, 80 years or something, a long time. Well, the so, driveway is not the concern. It would I understand. A house yeah. tucked behind. I gotcha. But, which there are instances around town, but yep. not typically in new development. No, I, no, I, I gotcha. But I was just pointing out there is a driveway there now. Whether that has any merit in that or not, I don't know, but. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, any other questions for the applicant? <clears throat> so for that lot that you're talking about that we're back and forth on a little bit, mm -hmm. so that driveway that you're talking about, would that be then extended to this extra unusual lot? Yeah, it right? really almost goes to that proposed property line now. Yeah. I mean, it, it starts to curve in a cul-de-sac type fashion, but it's within a few feet of our proposed lot line. So yes, we would extend it. We'd probably square it up a little. It's pretty straight coming off fourth. In other words, it's almost probably perfectly perpendicular, if you will, to fourth street, but there, it's a little bend to it and we'd probably straighten that out, but yeah. Okay. So yes. would that be a problem for the people that did maybe buy back there and build? to share that driveway is that going to be a shared driveway no it will be their driveway okay yeah you're gonna this is schrader with staff mm -hmm. um so for it to not be a shared driveway that means you'd intend to put in a new driveway for lot for, one yep for currently. the farm yes on the north side okay. yep yeah, and then the, and fine. then lot two would have their own driveway somewhere along fourth there okay. yep that was our thought. Okay, any other questions? Um, if he has more comments, but I wanted to address something quick if everybody's done. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and our staff, um, I didn't go very well into that, but. Um, I just want to back up and address the sidewalk situation. So if you look at the aerial map on page 50 in your packet, um, you'll see the two cul-de-sacs, Red Tail Drive and Chickadee Court. All the homes on those streets have sidewalks on their frontages. Um, it was discussed about 
to the north and south of the proposed plats of sidewalks on the backs of those properties. Sidewalk is not a requirement uh, on the back of a property uh, that has frontage up to a road. And we've also had discussion for a connection point across West 4th Street to get to the uh, west sidewalk there to go, you know, either north or south. And, um, and they have submitted um, site visibility uh, um, details on where the exact or ideal crossing of uh, going over 4th Street should be as far as, you know, traffic speeds and um, there is somewhat of a crown in the hill there, so. Okay. So this is Butchin. So are you recommending that they do have to have sidewalks? Per the subdivision ordinance, a sidewalk is a requirement on the frontage okay. of the lot. Okay. Okay, if there's no further discussion, um, we have a motion. Actually, do we need a motion to combine these two items, the preliminary and final plat? Okay, so let's just combine, since they're both basically the same, yep. we'll combine the preliminary and final plat uh, items one and two under C do on we need the agenda. A, excuse me, do we need an um, action item related to the sidewalk? It's part of that. You would only need to separate that out as a condition if you were going to recommend that sidewalk not be required. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. If there's no further discussion, uh, we'll entertain a motion. Well, I kind of agree. I, I think common sense says that, it, it, you know, <clears throat> Staff has just noted that they're not going to require sidewalks to the north or south because they're backyards. Um, so, if, you know, if the applicant is uh, would be willing to, uh, if sidewalks are needed in the future, that it's a uh, part of their deed to take dedication. I don't know if that's a good solution for the city or, or what. But um, I can I can I can see his his uh, reasoning. This is Schrader Estap. The flip side of that is it gets the residents in these five lots a sidewalk so that what, whatever point within this development, they go out their front door to a sidewalk to a funnel point that would be a crossing to the west side of 4th Street. So we're proposing that per the subdivision ordinance, they put in sidewalk there, but also a crossing. The crossing is basically just the, the approach uh, parts we wouldn't necessarily require an actual you know striped crossing all the way across 4th street you just have to have the approaches on both sides and it, it connects to the sidewalk on the west side of 4th street but can okay. it's i mean it's it's up to the commission can we say that um it's you put in a sidewalk upon development if there's nothing there, you don't put a sidewalk there. That That's the standard requirement in the deed of dedication. That you put a sidewalk in. When upon, it's developed. But development. as the applicant noted, the one lot already has a house on it and is developed. So he's correct. That would essentially require that that lot have the sidewalk put in upon final platting. Because I understand what, uh, Matt, you were saying, if it's a backyard, you know, why have a sidewalk there? But if you're having a frontage, I mean, I agree with the uh, uh, complete streets policy where you would need to have a sidewalk where people are going to be walking, you know. And this is Wilbur. I would echo that and say that it's also, for lack of a better word or phrase to describe it, kicking the can down the road to make it an issue for future property owners, I think really kind of complicates the matter. Um, speaking in a neighbor, I live in a neighborhood that doesn't have sidewalks. Um, and uh, I think the longer that time goes by, if you make it an issue for future property owners, I think it 
kind of becomes more of an issue as to, well, I didn't purchase the property with this in mind. And I understand that makes it complicated for the property owner that's already there. But I think, um, I mean, who knows if this area does grow. I mean, you have um, people that need uh, for mobility reasons, kids, um, you know, potentially, and you know, if the area does grow, I just think it kind of allows, even if it would be kind of capping it off at one point for um, allowing for growth down the road without making it the issue of the future lot owners. And the other thing we need to keep in mind is that you may not need a sidewalk right now because you're 25 and you're able-bodied and everything else, but people age into disability. And so you're gonna be 85 and frail and, you know, and now have a disability, so. Can I uh, comment? So quickly, I in no way am saying I don't want a sidewalk. I think eventually a sidewalk makes sense if it goes somewhere. But right now it goes nowhere. So if I put a sidewalk in where the farmhouse is, it ends in the 95 feet or whatever the front distance is of that home. And most people, well, maybe it's me, I'm a little lazy by nature, I'm just gonna cross 4th Street. Now if there is a dedicated, more safe crossing, then certainly I would go to that point. But I'm not saying we don't want a sidewalk. And it is sort of a kick the can because when we sell the lots, it's on the landowner at that time to then build a sidewalk. So it's always going to be their responsibility. All I was suggesting was if we build it today, particularly on the farmhouse lot, it goes nowhere. That's all I'm saying. But I think it's important that it gets put in there where at such time that it makes sense. But we're suggesting one crossing within this development to connect it so it doesn't go to nowhere. Yeah. And if that crossing is put in on the north end at this lot, then when the lots to the south build, it goes to that crossing, which gets them to the sidewalk to the west. Yeah. And I, I hey, I missed that point until today. I, I knew we did a site distance calc to put the driveway to the north on the farmhouse. I, I missed somewhere in the conversation back and forth that there was going to be a new uh, kind of crossing. I, I mean, it may have been said, but I didn't, I didn't hear it. It didn't register. So yeah, that's sort of a new twist, or not twist, but something I'd never considered. But anyway, yeah, I want a sidewalk. It's just when. So whatever you think is appropriate on that, you know, that's, that's fine. But thank you. Hey, I should also ask, and I apologize, if there's anybody here that wants to speak either for or against this item. Okay, seeing no one. More discussion, motion. So this is <clears throat> this is Button. So if we do approve this, are we saying, according to the city codes, that a sidewalk would be required? in the final plat. Yes, unless you make a motion to specifically change that. When it's developed. Yes. When developed. Can I just ask this then? When we've okayed other developments, and it seems like we've always okayed it with sidewalks, so why is this one any different, I guess? Is that I mean, a question we, to staff or to the rest well, of the commission? No, no. Because from a guess, staff standpoint, guess, it's not. <laughs> no, I guess what I'm saying is, so in these other developments that we have okayed, the sidewalk was already going to be put in with the development, and then the houses being built. No, the side. No, they do no? It the same way. The sidewalk goes in as each individual lot is developed. Okay. So All here, right. I kind of change. I flip flopped based on Eric's comments on what my viewpoint is. It's not just somebody needs to go north of lot one or south of lot four it's it's within the group within those four lots or five lots excuse me and then right. they'll also have an ability to cross the streets so that's right that's the hope for the plan so that, right um i guess i'm just wondering whether the developer if we approve this as the city code does he have to put all those sidewalks in ahead of the houses he no. does not no but is he responsible or is the homeowner responsible? I thought he said the homeowner, 
homeowners would be responsible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just part of city code that if they buy the house, they would have to put it in. Mm -hmm. So we're only approving that he would really have to put one in in front of the farmhouse right now. Is that correct? Because that lot's already because developed. it's already developed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did that make sense? Yeah, I think the question was right on. Yeah, that's okay. the question. <laughs> okay. We have a motion or further discussion. So, um, so I would so move that, um, according to staff recommending, that the request for. Do I have to say temporary and final plat or just final plat? No, both. both. Pre just preliminary. 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 I'm sorry, preliminary and final plot of the 3.01 acres into five residential lots located at 4245 West 4th Street be approved for the following reasons. Crest would not appear to have a negative impact on the surrounding area. The plot would provide for new residential development, which would be compatible with already existing development in the nearby vicinity. The request would not appear to have a negative impact upon pedestrian and travel conditions within the surrounding area. The request is in accordance with the subdivision ordinance. The request is in conformance with the future land use map and comprehensive plan for this area, which designates this area as low density residential, subject to the following conditions, that the final plat and accompanying documents are updated as required by staff before it is forwarded to the city council. Second. Wait, in the preliminary plat as well, right? We, I said that in the beginning. Yeah. Oh, but preliminary and covers final. Both. Okay. This, yeah. Sorry. Yep. Second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, that motion is carried. Thank you. Um, moving on to item D, number one. This is a this is a vacation or vacate of a street, or actually an alley. Grain EGs, excuse me. Request by Jesse Hoviter, and if I pronounce that wrong, I do apologize, to vacate the northeasterly five feet of a platted 20 foot drainage and utility easement for the purposes of constructing a new detached garage located at 1731 Carriage Hill Drive. Staff report. Okay, um, yeah, this is, I'm just going to kind of speed this along. This is just a very simple request, just basically vacating the first five feet of a 20-foot uh, drainage easement. Um, the, the applicant is just requesting to vacate the first five feet of a platted 20-feet easement located along the rear yard of the property for the construction of a 26 by 32 square foot garage. Uh, there appears to be no utilities located in the easement and no future need for that portion of the easement. The property is also adjacent to 1725 Carriage Hill Drive um, or Carriage Hill Lot 28. Lots 28 through 32 already had 10 feet of the 20-foot easement vacated on March 1st, 1993 as part of Ordinance 3927. Uh, Waterloo Engineering Department indicated that they were okay with vacating the first five of the 20-foot drainage utility easement in the rear yard, but no more than five feet due to the existing drainage ditch within the remaining 15 feet of the drainage utility easement. Um, and there's no platting a part of this request. Uh, therefore, staff recommends that the request to vacate the first five feet of the platted 20 foot drainage and utility easement located along the southerly rear yard property line to allow for the construction of a 26 by 32, 832 square foot detached garage be approved for the following reasons. The request would not appear to have a negative impact on the surrounding area. The request would not appear to have a negative impact upon pedestrian and traffic conditions within the surrounding area. There appears to be no need for the extra easement width, and the area would appear to have adequate drainage with the remaining 15 feet easement. And that's a staff report. Okay, I don't know if it's a question for staff, it's a comment. I have a note here that in another part of the document, or another part of the packet document that Knutson, I think it's Jamie Knutson or Brian, whatever. Knutson was saying um, that the new garage could not extend into the remaining 15 feet, 15 feet of the existing easement. Does staff or anybody have concern about that or do we just need to keep that in mind? No concerns and the applicant is aware of that. He's looking to vacate the five feet so that he can get the garage five feet closer than what he otherwise would would be but he's aware he'd have to keep it out of the remaining 15 feet okay thank you 
Any other questions for staff? Okay, if not, is the applicant or someone representing the applicant here? And if you are, please come forward. If you tell us what you'd like to tell us. I'm Jesse Hogar. I live 1731 Carriage Hill Drive. When I tore my drive down, I thought it was a grandfather day and rejoicing down to get my permit to <coughs> pour the concrete. And they told him, no, it's not. It was built wrong in the first place. So I'm just asking for that, for that. I moved my garage back instead of moving it towards the house. So your garage, the garage you had was already in part of the easement? Yeah. Okay. The old garage, no, it was yeah. setting back. The old garage. It was on 18 yeah. feet instead of 20. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. Anything else you want to tell us? I've been waiting since June. <laughs> okay. <laughs> June, uh, okay. I thought I'd have it built for now. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> if there's no further questions for the applicant, uh, is there anyone in the room that would like to speak either for or against this item? Okay, seeing no one come forward. This is me. I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the vacate. Oh, with, um, yeah. Okay, we have a motion to approve the vacate. Uh, you have a second as well. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. If there, is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion's carried. Oh, yeah, and, um, uh, Mr. Hovatter, the, the next step would be City Council being in contact with you so we can get this put on the agenda so you can get your garage up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day or evening. Thank you. Next is item E, hearings for zoning ordinance amendment. Um, we have the statement I got to read. This is a public hearing. Oh, no, because it doesn't have notice. Okay. The amendment is to the City of Waterloo Zoning Ordinance Alcohol Sales Use Overlay District, Church Row Neighborhood Overlay District. We have staff report. This is Schrader with staff. I did send out a memo with an overview of the amendment, the actual proposed amendment showing the strike through and underline um, changes to the zoning ordinance and then a map of the proposed uh, overlay district expansion. So staff is proposing changes to the zoning ordinance. Um, the uh, changes involve the uh, alcohol uh, sales restrictions. As the main change is in the overlay district for the Church Road neighborhood district. It expands uh, in the area it's bounded by um, south of Williston, north of Carolina, east of Kimball, and west of Vermont Street. And then the other minor change is to um, uh, the e exemption for um, grocery stores. The current exemption is for grocery stores with retail floor space that exceeds 10,000 square feet, the amendment would increase that to 15,000 square feet. Are there any questions for staff? Yeah, um, this is Duna. I never got the memo you were referring to. Was that email that I just missed that in my email or what went on there? I didn't get it either. Oh, this is Schrader with staff. Yeah, that was emailed just um, a couple of days ago, so. Oh, I must have missed that then. Apologize if you didn't get that. Um, yeah, well, I would just have it. to look through my material again. Okay. I can just go look at it now if you'd like. This is me. What's the reasoning for the uh, change? Um, this is Schrader with staff. So there is the old uh, Byron Avenue High V location that um, recently applied for their uh, alcohol sales uh, licenses that generated. Um, a significant amount of debate at the city council was tabled initially. Uh, and then when it came back before the council, um, 
the beer and wine uh, permit was approved, the liquor license was not, and there was discussion by the council uh, and some um, suggestion by some on the council that we should look to expand the overlay district uh, to cover that area. So that's the primary reason this is now before the commission. And this is Butch, and I actually stopped by that location today just, just to check it out. And when I talked to the co-owner of the location, he said that they will not be appealing the alcohol or the liquor part. So they will not be at this time, just because of the people that spoke about it at the last meeting, that they won't do any liquor and they're not even going to do wine. They're just going to have beer, just so you know that. Thank you. Yes, I was nosy. <laughs> Any other discussion amongst commissioners? If, if not, uh, anyone in the room that is in favor or would like to speak for or against this item, please come to the podium. Now, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Last but not least, they you missed us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, the, the main reason that we wanted to come to make sure that you understood that um, we feel very strongly that this overlay needs to be expanded to incorporate our neighborhood association. We have eight liquor stores within a 10 block radius of the six corners. We don't need any more. And, you know, we were really fortunate that the city council heard our plea and, and agreed um, uh, to limit the liquor, um, not to allow the liquor, but only beer and wine. And that's a great start. Um, but, you know, if, if truth be told, I wish that we could have had none um, available at that site just simply because where that store is located right next door to um, apartments that um, we have a large number of savory type individuals that live there um, and so to give them access where all they have to do literally is walk out their back door and go into that store and purchase beer or liquor would be the absolute worst thing that we could do to our neighborhood. Um, since that store, when it was open before, not as the Byron Street hy -Vee, but the other um, uh, store that was in there. And we had just had, were inundated with police calls and calls for, um, neighbors' homes being invaded, people, elderly people being beat up in their homes by people that were breaking in to, to rob them. And, you know, it was a scary time in our neighborhood. And we finally got rid of that when that door, when that store closed. But now um, we have to be, you know, vigilant and trying to keep this from happening again. And that was our primary concern is that we just absolutely did not want to have this come back into our neighborhood. And Craig, you know, you live just outside of our neighborhood association, but, you know, I've talked with people over on the other side of Kimball that has said, you know, we've seen it coming this way and you know and it's a shame um i my heart goes out to these people that talk tonight about you know their concerns and we were there for a different reason you know when you have a nice neighborhood that goes south you know you're desperate to try and do whatever you need to do to try and make your neighborhood safe again and so people can feel safe in their homes and that's really why we wanted to make sure that this overlay gets passed and so that we don't have to worry about any more liquor 
um, establishments coming into our neighborhood. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Can I can I make a comment to Carol then before you sit down? Sure. <laughs> so, with what I found out today, is beer an issue for you guys? We would prefer it not to be. You know, the people that live there live in those apartments. They only have to walk three blocks to the closest liquor store in the six corners. You know, and it, again, for me, it was always proximity. It was, you know, the easy access of it. Um, but, you know, um, you know, it's already been voted, it's been approved. And, you know, so all we can do is, is just um, hope and pray that it will be okay. Well, that's why I wanted to let you know that there won't be wine, but yeah, according to them right now, but they're, they're very willing to work with the neighborhood. I do know that. So this is Schrader with staff. If this is passed as proposed, <clears throat> it will essentially have no effect on the current business going in there. But if that business were to cease operations and no other business goes in for a period of three months, uh, then any new business would have to meet all of the overlay restrictions, which you know, between the existing overlay restrictions and the uh, amended version on grocery store, it would essentially um, preclude that site from having any off-premise consumption alcohol, including beer. I don't remember what the square footage of that property is right now. Do you? I know they said that at the meeting, but I don't remember. More than 10,000. About 12,000 square yeah. feet. Okay. <laughs> So this Thank would you. change it to 15,000 if any other business goes in there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in the room that would like to speak either for or against this item? Okay. All right, seeing no one coming forward. Um, I understand Eric just stepped out for a minute. He, he'll be right back. Do we... Uh, that's what I was going to ask you if we need him for a quorum. We'll just, well, if there's any discussion amongst commissioners, this is the time to do it. I do have a couple points towards it. Um, first, first is uh, I echo your sentiments, um, but I also want to keep in mind that it's been a grocery store. I've, I've uh, gone there myself growing up many, many times, and uh, um, even when I was 21 years old to, uh, you know, buy a beer there once or twice. So, um, but, uh, so, uh, you know, changing the, you know, changing the, um, conditions to it, I think really affect the property value for that property owner. So I want to bring that up. My second point is that, uh, in our business, we have a, uh, you know, we represent a lot of tenants and buyers and, and uh, a growing need is uh, grocery stores for different smaller mini grocery stores for different types of um, ethnic groups. So we're seeing more and more of these, I'll call them mini marts, but that's not probably the appropriate time, uh, appropriate term. Um, so I could see it being detrimental to somebody that wants to have a nice established business, um, you know, and, and uh, for that. So and the last thing is I hope it's a, uh, it sounds like maybe it's a mute point that they're not even, you know, gonna go through with their liquor request. But so, um, you know. Yeah, just to, just to respond to what you just said, Matt. What happened in conjunction with when the Byron Street High V closed, those apartment buildings changed hands. And the people that had them before their clientele was mostly um, EPI individuals or retired people that lived in those apartments. And when the owners changed hands, then they started letting other people in and so the people that had been living there started moving out and so we had a, a store that was a, a literally cornerstone of the neighborhood leave and um, 
and it changed hands. And then we had those apartments that changed hands. And so those two were a bad mix. Um, and that was that was the difference. No, we we would love to have a business that came in and, you know, was, you know, their heart was for the neighborhood and wanting the best for the neighborhood. But the past businesses that have been in there, that's not been the case. So um, these people that are in there now are going to have to prove themselves um, to the neighborhood. Um, and we don't wish them well, or uh, we don't wish them poorly. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, we want to make sure that, you know, we don't slide back to where we were a few years ago um, with houses being broken into and people getting beat up, so. Understood. I have a question now. Sure. Uh, this is do not. Um, this is the question for staff. Um, what was the two parts that we were looking to approve or not approve? One was the overlay district, but there was a second part at the very beginning of your presentation about what to approve or not approve. What was the first part? So, yeah, there are essentially two parts to the amendment. The one changes the boundary. That's the map. The, that overlay, was, the, the, ma overlay, yep, the overlay boundary, yeah. the map that was in your packet. Mm -hmm. uh, the other tweaks the grocery store square footage requirement to meet the exemption to the alcohol sales provisions increases that number from 10,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet. And that's found in uh, three different spots within the zoning ordinance in this uh, C1 neighborhood commercial district, um, subsection uh, C, uh, it's changing that 10,000 square foot to 15,000 square foot. The specific sentences, the limitations of this paragraph shall not apply to a grocery store in which the retail floor space in the building equals or exceeds and the previous number was 10,000 square feet. The proposed number is 15,000 square feet or to a pharmacy. And then there are the similar wording in the chapter 24A, which is the overlay district. And then there's also a similar provision in the outdoor sign restrictions, changing that for uh, 10,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet. Same wording, the limitations of this paragraph shall not apply to establishments located in that one also covers the C3 commercial district, but to any grocery store in which the retail floor space in the building equals or exceeds 10,000 proposed to go to 15,000 square feet or to a pharmacy. So those are the, the essentially the two changes are the change to the boundary of the overlay district and taking 10,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet in three different spots in the ordinance. Okay, any other questions? This is Wilbur. Um, I just want to point out for the commission that I think we need to, I want to reiterate what um, Commissioner Meehy said, and then also point out that I think we need to be cognizant that we're not talking about characteristic of certain um, people living in the neighborhood and that we're talking about considerations of the neighborhood and businesses going in. Um, I just wanted to point that out. And here's, and this is kind of a side point, and I know this is not exactly what Carol was getting at, but just because you have a disability and just because you may uh, have that disability and roll the ETI doesn't necessarily mean that you don't like to drink. So um, just wanted to point that out. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, if there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion one way or the other. Okay, so I was going to make a motion. Okay. Um, my motion is to accept the ordinance changes as presented and also ex uh, um, move that we expand the um, the expansion of the overlay district as uh, presented. Okay, we have a motion. I would second that. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Okay. 
I said I. Sorry. Oh, 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 so it's three to one. See, four to one. Four to one. Yeah. Well, I can't vote oh. unless you have a tie. No, you vote. Right. Okay, then I'll vote I. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. Are there any discussion items? We're good. I'd just oh. like to make one comment. Sure. And this is just for all of us, okay? I know that today at 4 o'clock there was a civility training out at Hawkeye, and I just want to say that I am so glad to be a part of this commission. We all get along. We may disagree on some things, but we all get along, and I just want to say that I'm glad to be part of this commission. I'll Thank second you. that comment. <laughs> Thank you. Motion for adjournment. Second. We have a motion, second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned.